Good evening, brothers and sisters. This is Jim Beckwith reporting. I'll be your host for the World News Prophetic Update. We have about 24 pieces of news here tonight, so we need to move along. A little bit of uh, July 16th date, about three or four stories of that inside of it. Anyway, as we start here, on the local no experts baffled by freak downpour in Norway. A goalie ripped in the earth by the freak downpour. Norwegian experts have been left baffled by a tropical downpour that hit a village north of Trondheim on Monday. This only happens in the jungle, said one meteorologist. Norway floods set to cost over 200 kilometers kroner. Soberg to visit flood devastation in Norway. Severe flooding hits western Norway. The onslaught came suddenly on Monday afternoon with an estimated 102 mil millimeters of rain bucketing down on the village of Ogdal in a single hour, followed by a heavy hail which left a layer of ice across the area. This just does not happen in Norway. We have a hard time believing that it's true, Geir Ottar Fagerly, a government meteorologist, told NRK. It's not that we doubt the observations, but it is absolutely amazing. These are figures that you only normally see in the jungle, he continued, estimating that the country's unofficial record is probably somewhere between 80 to 90 millimeters per hour. Kristen Watland Del Delbeck, a farmer and tourist guide who has lived in the village for 28 years, said that she had never seen anything like it. It was horrible. There was such a lot of rain in one hour. It was so strange for us, she told the local. The animals were really afraid. The cows don't understand what was happening. Here's the volume of hail shown in the picture here. And the next thing up is the future cost of politically correct cultism. I rarely touch on the subject of political correctness as a focus in my writings partially because the entire issue is so awash in pundits on either side that the scrambling clatter of voices tend to drown out the liberty movement perspective. Also, I don't really see PC cultism as separate from the problems I am always battling against, collectivism and the erasure of the individual in the name of pleasing society. Political correctness is nothing more than a tool that collectivists and status exploit in order to better achieve their end game, which is conning the masses into believing that the group mind is real and that the individual mind is fiction. Last year, I covered the PC issue in my article, The Twisted Motives Behind Bo Political Correctness. I believe I analyzed the bulk of the issue extensively. However, the times are changing at a pace that boggles the mind, and this is my, de this is by design. So it may be necessary to square off against this monstrosity once again, in order to better examine the true insanity of what many people now term social justice warriors. I must study a few aspects of that strange movement separately. First, let's take a brief look at the mindset of your average social justice circus clown so that we might better understand what makes him or her tick. Notice it says, it tick. Rebel without a legitimate cause. I spent several years up until 2004 when I spoke up from the false paradigm madness. As a Democrat, and before anyone judges that particular decision, I would suggest they keep in mind the outright fascist brothel for the military-industrial complex the Republican Party had become at that point and remains to this day. Almost every stepping stone that Barack Obama is using today to eradicate the Constitution was set in place by the Bush dynasty, including the authorization of military force, which was the foundation for the National Defense Authorization Act and the legal precedence for indefinite detention without trial of any person, including an American citizen, accused of terrorism by the President of the United States, as well as the use of assassination by executive order and the implementation of mass electronic surveillance without warrant. But hell, 
These are real issues, issues that many of my fellow Democrats at the time claimed they actually cared about. Today, though, liberal concerns about unconstitutional actions by the federal government have all but vanished. Today, the left fights the good fight against flags on the hoods of cars from long-canceled television shows and battles tooth and nail for the right of boys wearing wigs and skirts to use the girls' bathroom. Today, the left even fights to remove the words boy and girl from our vocabulary. Yes, such noble pursuits as these will surely be remembered as a pinnacle in the annals of societal reform. Maybe I realize the ideological goals of the social justice machine are meaningless on a surface level, and maybe you realize this too, but these people live in their own little universe which doesn't extend far beyond the borders of their college campuses, the various web forms they have hijacked in a trendy Marxist wind and swinger party here and there in New York or Hollywood. They actually think that they are on some great social crusade on the par with the civil rights movement of the mid-1900s. They think they are the next Martin Luther King Jr. or the next Gandhi. The underlying banality and pointlessness of their cause completely escapes them. The PC cult is, in many respects, the antithesis of the liberty movement. We fight legitimate threats against legitimate freedoms. They fight mostly imaginary threats and seek to eradicate freedoms. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes our concerns do align. For instance, liberty proponents fight back against the militarization of police just as avidly as leftists do, if not more so, but our movements handle the problem in very different ways. Look at Ferguson, Missouri, where anyone with any sense should be able to admit that the government response to protests was absolutely a step toward tyranny, ignoring violent looters while attacking peaceful activists. Leftists and PC cultists decide to follow the Sololinsky communist playbook, bussing in provocateurs from Chicago to further loot and burn down bus businesses even if they belong to ethnic minorities. In the meantime, the Liberty Movement and Oath Keepers sent armed and trained men to defend those businesses regardless of those who owned them and defied police and federal agents who tried to stop them. The left gave the police and government a rationale for being draconian while we removed the need for police and government entirely by providing security for the neighborhood killing two birds with one stone. Either their methods are purely ignorant and do not work or their methods are meant to achieve the opposite of their claims. In the end, the PC movement only serves establishment goals toward a fully collectivist and centralized society. Their publicly stated intentions are otherwise pointless. Your average PC drone does not understand the grander plan at work, nor does he want to. All he cares about is that he has found a purpose, a fabricated purpose, as a useful idiot for power brokers, but a purpose nonetheless. People must be forced to bake gay cakes. I personally do not care if two people of the same gender want to be in a relationship, but I do find the issue of gay marriage and marriage in general a rather odd conflict that misses the whole point. Marriage has been always and will be a religious institution, not federal, and I find government involvement in this institution to be rather despicable. When the Supreme Court's decision on gay marriage went down, I felt a little sorry for all the joyful hopping homosexuals on the marbled steps of the hallowed building, primarily because they essentially were fighting for the state to provide recognition and legitimacy for the relationships. Frankly, who gives a rip what the state has to say in terms of your relationships or mine? The state is an arbitrary edifice, edifice a facade wielding illusory power. If a relationship is based on true and enduring connection, then that is all that matters, whether the Supreme Court dignifies it or not. Okay, that's a very interesting read. I'm going to let you read the rest. We've got to get going here. Netanyahu set on seeking U.S. allies against Iran deal. Is that possible? Benjamin Netanyahu's approach has been described as a course by the German foreign minister and way over the top by John Kerry. Israel's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, well, that 
those comments from John Kerry and and uh, um, the German foreign minister uh, it's it's par for the course, isn't it? Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu appeared determined to push allies in the U.S. Congress to block the nuclear deal between Iran and six world powers, despite warnings his strategy would fail and further damage relations with Obama administration. But then who really cares about that? With few Israeli analysts de demonstrating any confidence Israel could muster the two-thirds support in Congress needed to overcome a pres presidential veto, a chorus of voices warned against persisting with a strategy they fear has left Israel increasingly marginalized. Mr. Netanyahu's approach has been described as coarse by the German Foreign Minister Frank Walter Steinmeier and way over the top by John Kerry, the U.S. Secretary of State. Mr. Obama is bullishly confident opponents in Congress will not be able to overturn the deal. Pessimistic number crunching by Israeli analysts echoes Mr. Obama's view. They point out congressional opponents would require 44-8 out of the 188 Democrats in the House of Representatives to oppose the president in the midst of a presidential election cycle and following the endorsement of the deal by Hillary Clinton, the leading Democratic candidate. Uh, next up, as we move along, bookkeeper of Auschwitz found guilty by German count court. Excuse me. Lewenberg, Germany. A 94-year-old German man known as Bookkeeper of Auschwitz was sentenced to four years in prison for his role in the murder of 300,000 people at the Nazi death camp in what could be one of the last big Holocaust trials. Betraying little emotion, white-haired Oscar Groening sat with his arms crossed looking around the courtroom while the judge explained the verdict. 94 years old. He looks well preserved, doesn't he? Looks like he's lived very well, very good life. After the hearing, he shuffled out of the court, hunched over a walking frame with his head bowed. He remains free until a decision on whether and how much of his jail time he will have to serve. He shouldn't have to serve much. He only killed 300,000, though. Groening did not kill anyone himself while working at the camp in Nazi-occupied Poland, but by sorting banknotes and seized from trainloads of arriving Jews, he helped support the regime responsible for mass murder, prosecutors argued. The trial went to the heart of the question of whether people who were minor participants in the Nazi regime but did not actively participate in the killing of six million Jews during the Holocaust were themselves guilty. Well, let's see if if whoever is running the show, they're not they're not guilty, right? It's only the poor uh, people that were armed, the you know soldiers that were told what to do at gunpoint. They're the only ones that are guilty, right? That just makes sense. After all, just because he was helping to fund it through book book work, that doesn't mean anything either. I mean, they can run without any money, right? Next story. Next up from the Inquisitor, rapper Baby Killed in Chicago Gang Violence. Chicago rapper Capo and Innocent Baby and an Innocent Baby miles away were killed in Chicago gang violence over the weekend. The New York Daily News is reporting the rapper was gunned down in a drive-by shooting on the city's south side. Minutes later, the baby was run over by the fleeing suspect's vehicle. Rapper Capo, whose real name was Marvin Carr, was a member of Chief Keefe's Glow Gang. A Chief Keefe is another Chicago rapper. Carr was known to be a gangbanger, according to police. At about 1.40 p.m. on Saturday, the rapper was shot in the leg and back in an apparent drive-by shooting, according to the Chicago Sun-Times. He was taken to a hospital where he died in a short time later. His manager, Ronaldo Hess expressed shock at his client's death. He was a good kid. The streets of Chicago is something. He was murdered. I don't understand what is going on with all these kids. He was a good kid. He was only a rapper. Unfortunately, as this is the case with a lot of gang violence, the intended victim wasn't the only person who died. Minutes after the rapper was shot, an innocent baby, later identified as Dylan Harris, was killed when the fleeing suspects swerved off of the street and ran him over with their car. 
According to the Chicago Tribune, the baby and his family were waiting at a bus stop for a day trip to the beach when he was killed. His mother, who declined to be identified, tried to save him. I was trying to save my baby. I never imagined this would happen. My son gone so soon. Chicago Alderman Willie Cochran, in whose ward the rapper and baby were killed, said that some of his constituents have blamed the police for the baby's death, saying that the baby wouldn't have been killed if the cops hadn't chased the fleeing gangbangers. All right, next news from Yahoo. Israel assassinated top Syrian general leaked U.S. files. Israel is responsible for the 2008 murder of a top security aide of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, according to secret U.S. intelligence files. Brigadier General Mohammed Slayman was shot in the head and neck on August 1, 2008 by a small team of Israeli commandos as he enjoyed a dinner party at his luxury seaside home on the Syrian coast, said the Intercept website. Citing the leaked files, the Israeli military team then escaped by sea. The Internal National Security Agency document provided by former NSA contractor Edward Snowden is the first official confirmation that the assassination of Slayman was an Israeli military operation, said the website. The revelation ends speculation that an internal dispute within the Syrian government led to his death, it added. The NSA's internal v version of Wikipedia, Intellipedia, described the assassination near the port town of Tartus as the first known instance of Israel targeting a legitimate government official, according to The Intercept. And next up is Mayor Bragg's Our White Population Plummets, he says. The mayor of Kansas City, Kansas, is an address to the radical socialist organization National Council of La Raza, bragged that his city is no longer, he's bragging, no longer majority white and the city, city's schools now have students who speak 62 different languages. Well, thanks to President Obama and company. According to the 2010 U.S. Census, Kansas City was 52% white in 2010, but in a speech before the La Raza National Affiliates luncheon earlier this week in Kansas City, Mayor Mark Holland boasted that only five years later, his city's white population has been reduced to 40%. Interesting. He seemed to suggest that La Raza was at least partly responsible for the progress, but he also cited the refugee resettlement work of the United Nations and the U.S. State Department for the city's transformation into a gleaming example of a multicultural diversity. Kansas City, he said, is very proud of the work of National Council of La Raza. Is this really good news? Folks, you better think twice if you really think it is. American evangelicals stand behind Israel. Christians should support Israel. 14% disagree, 6% not sure, and 80% do agree. American evangelicals remain among the strongest supporters of the nation of Israel. Most believe God has plans for that nation both now and in the future. And many of America's preachers say Christians need to support Israel. Those are among the findings of a study of American attitudes toward Israel and the Bible from Nashville-based Lifeway Research. As part of the study, researchers conducted two separate surveys of 1,000 Americans along with a survey of 1,000 senior pastors of Protestant churches. No piece of literature has had more impact on the American culture than the Bible, said Scott McConnell, vice president of Lifeway Research. No country is more intertwined with the ancient biblical narrative than Israel, and evangelical Americans see a contemporary connection with the nation. Hundreds gather for a rally for freedom of worship on the Temple Mount. From Isaiah 56, verse 7, it says, These will... These I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. 
Temple Mount activists hold placards as they protest outside the Temple Mount in Jerusalem's Old City on July 14th, following the closing of the Temple Mount to Jews till the end of the Muslim month of Ramadan. Tuesday evening, Temple Mount Heritage Foundation founder and activist Rabbi Yehuda Glick led a demonstration at the Dung Gate in the Old City of Jerusalem protesting the recent closures of the Temple Mount to non-Muslims during the Ramadan holiday. The Temple Mount Heritage Foundation along with several other groups and organizations working to increase access on the Temple Mount decided to hold a peaceful demonstration to protest the most recent closure of the Temple Mount which will be lifted when Ramadan ends on July 17th in about a day and a half. Next up from the Telegraph, why critics of the Iran deal should hope Obama is like Neville Chamberlain. British statesman and Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain at Heston Airport on his return from Munich after meeting with Hitler making his Peace in Our Time address. It was just a few weeks after the September 11th attacks, and suddenly U.S.-Israel attentions, excuse me, tensions were erupting. The White House was furious at Prime Minister Ariel Sharon for essentially comparing President George W. Bush's efforts to line up Arab support for his war on terror to Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. Don't repeat the terrible mistake of 1938 when the enlightened democracies of Europe decided to sacrifice Czechoslovakia for a temporary solution. Do not try to placate the Arabs at our expense, Sharon defiantly declared. Israel will not be Czechoslovakia. As it happened shortly after Sharon's remarks, his predecessor, Ehud Barak, was making an appearance at a fundraising gala at a posh hotel in Midtown Manhattan. When buttonholed by this reporter for a response, Barack expressed a measure of sympathy for Sharon's concerns but criticized the appeasement reference. Barack insisted that such talk was off the mark and out of place at a time when British Prime Minister Tony Blair and Bush were playing the respective roles of Churchill and Roosevelt in forging a global alliance against Al-Qaeda and terrorism. In retrospect, that controversy turned out to be a blip. It didn't take long for Sharon to change his tune and race to align Israel's diplomatic and security strategies with the Bush administration's agenda on most fronts. Now, with the ink still wet on the U.S.-backed deal with Iran, it's hard to imagine a similar reapproachment for Barack Obama and Benjamin Netanyahu. If Sharon's Czechoslovakia comment was an outburst, Netanyahu's condemnations of the Iran deal has been a drumbeat, with repeated warnings that the world powers were on course to sign an agreement that would effectively appease Tehran's long-term nuclear ambitions and pose a genocidal threat to Israel. The deal might be done, but Netanyahu isn't backing down. The international community is removing the sanctions, and Iran is keeping its nuclear program, Netanyahu said at a news conference Tuesday. And next up, it says, guess what each of the U.S. Jewish organizations are saying about the Iran deal. We know the Iran deal is bad. How bad it is is we all may be spending the rest of our lives finding out. That is, unless someone members of the Congress are able to inject sufficient spine strengthening and strengthening serum to override President Barack Obama's already promised veto of any effort to derail the deal. So let's take a stroll through the playground of American Jewish organizations and see what they have to say about the proposed deal which allows many of the things American leaders swore would not be permitted and forbids many of the things that were promised would be included. First, let's lay out the general parameters of the deal as they are currently understood based on analysis of the 159 page document. Well, unfortunately, I don't have time to read this going to take at least 15 more minutes to read this. And the next one up is Volunteer Watchdog Group Dispatches to Western States to Monitor Jade Helm. Yes, today is the first day of Jade Helm, according to the reports, July 15th. 
supposed to end in two months. Washington, a controversial U.S. military training exercise known as Operation Jade Helm, rolls out this week across several southwestern states, but a group of wary citizen watchdogs will be keeping an eye on them. Pete Lanteri, a former Marine now living in Arizona, told FoxNews.com that volunteer members he helped organize will be on the ground as part of a newly formed surveillance campaign called Counter Jade Helm, a product of mounting suspicions across western states over the exercise itself the group has been set up to locate, track, and observe U.S. soldiers, Green Berets, Air Force Special Ops, Navy SEALs training across the Southwest. The three-month military exercise kicks off Wednesday. Lanteri laid down the notion that the counter-campaign could lead to conflict. Oh, I guess it's three months. Let's see, July to August is one, August to September. I guess it's going to be in December. October 15th, okay. We're not paranoid tin hat wearing freaks, Lanteri told foxnews.com. Well, maybe it'll just continue after October 15th through the whole winter. Who knows? We're not... R rather, Lanteri and his volunteers will be in plain clothes, in plain sight, and armed with only cell phones and video cameras, he says. He plans to travel... See, now they're really going to protect you, Right? Mm -hmm. They're going to protect you with their cell phones. So, rest assured, those cell phones are going to take care of those tanks and all those other military weapons. Okay, next one is shock video. Now, I've already shown the video on this one. Very disturbing about Planned Parenthood. You can check it out. So, made a separate video of this. From the Ynet opinion, Israel will survive nuclear deal. The off Ed says the fact that Israel failed to thwart the agreement with Iran and didn't even influence its content is a total failure. But instead of giving Israelis a realistic account of what happened, Netanyahu is informing them that a Holocaust is on the way. In all the 159 pages of the agreement with Iran, I couldn't find a single mention of Israel, not even a hint. On one hand, it's a good thing. Have the world powers applied the same demands that they are applying on the Iranian nuclear program on Israel, we would be in deep trouble. On the other hand, it's outrageous. An agreement of fatal importance to everyone living here has been signed above our heads as if there is nothing between Tehran and Vienna apart from the Ayatollah regime's good intentions. There is no Israel. The disregard of Israel is not only insulting, it's dangerous. It may be hiding more dangers for Israel apart from the Iranian nuclear threshold. In some sense, it takes us back to 1956 when U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower and Soviet Union Prime Minister Nikolai Bolganin sent threatening letters to Israel and forced it to withdraw from Sinai. The American Congress applauded our Prime Minister. The Vienna negotiators ignored him. Judging from the outcome, it would have been better if they had applauded him less and showed more consideration towards his country. Obama and Vice President Joe Biden, there's the Obama and company, Netanyahu's chances of getting 13 Democrats to break the president's veto aren't big. The agreement's different sections deal with two issues, and with these two issues only, nukes and sanctions but their ramifications are Im immeasurably wide. It's not by chance that the global media rushed to refer to the agreement as historic way beyond the nuclear issue. It marks a possible turning point in the balance of power in the Middle East, in Iran's diplomatic and economic and perhaps military standing and in its relations with the international community and first of all with the United States. The Ayatollah regime earned worldwide legitimization without committing to change its agenda in any way, apart from freezing the nuclear program for 10 to 15 years. And the next one from Ynet says Obama Netanyahu cannot stop Iran deal. U.S. President says Prime Minister will not succeed in using Congress to defeat the deal. Kerry says Israel is safer thanks to agreement, noting critics of deal never offer a realistic alternative. 
U.S. President Barack Obama on Tuesday defended the agreement reached with Iran over its nuclear program, making it clear that the purpose of the deal was simply to prevent the Islamic Republic from attaining nuclear weapons, not to curb its global power. Congress still needs to sign off on the deal, which could result in a fierce battle in the legislature. In an exclusive New York Times interview, Obama said that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu perhaps thinks he can further influence the congressional debate, but that he was confident the agreement would be approved. But after that's done, if that's what he thinks is appropriate, then I will sit down, as we have consistently throughout my administration, and then ask some very practical questions. How do we prevent Hezbollah from acquiring more sophisticated weapons? How do we build on the success of Iron Dome, which the United States worked with Israel to develop and has saved Israeli lives? In the same way, I'm having conversation with the Gulf countries about how do we have a more effective interdiction of policy? How do we build more effective governance structures and military structures in Sunni areas that have essentially become a void that the Islamic State has filled or that in some cases Iranian activities can exploit? The White House on Tuesday announced that Obama would send Defense Secretary Ash Carter to the Middle East next week. The only confirmed stop on the trip was Israel, although officials said Carter would also visit other countries in the region. And this report from Reuters Iran deal as seen online. New Horizons or Impending Apocalypse? Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif talks to journalists as he stands on the balcony of Palais Coburg, the venue for nuclear talks. With Iran deal one of the top trending topics on the Twitter on Tuesday, opinions of both politicians and thousands of social network users split as of whether the hard-reached nuclear agreement is a victory of democracy or the beginning of the end. Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif's post ahead of the official announcement of the deal is among the most popular Iran deal tweets. The Iranian official called the result of the year-long talks a triumph of diplomacy. Now, you see, if they're saying that, you can, you can definitely believe it is the beginning of the end. What's up in space? Almost no chance of flares. Solar activity is very low. No sunspots are actively flaring, and as a result, excuse me, the sun's X-ray output has flatlined. NOAA forecasters estimate a minuscule 1% chance of M minus or X class solar flares on July 15th. The mysterious mountains of Pluto. New Horizons is starting to beam back some of the high-resolution photos it took during Tuesday's breakneck, breakneck flyby of Pluto. One of the first images show a mountain range with peaks jutting as high as 11,000 feet above the surface of the icy body. These mountains on Pluto likely formed no more than 100 million years ago. Um, scratch that. Mere youngsters in a 4.56 billion year old solar system, this suggests Pluto may still be geologically active today. Gotta admit, it's nice to see pictures of Pluto, though, for the first time. Okay, Obama lays out a sweeping criminal justice reform plan. I'm sure this one's gonna fix it, though. President Barack Obama has called for sweeping reforms to the U.S. criminal justice system, including curbing the use of solitary confinement and voting rights for felons. Yes, that makes sense. Don't put them in solitary confinement and give them voting rights. He said lengthy mandatory minimum sentences should be reduced or thrown out entirely. Give those abominable people voting rights. Mass incarceration makes our entire country worse off and we need to do something about it, he said. Yes, let's continue to, to uh, bring in more nasty people from other countries and continue to um, arrest good citizens of America, falsely arrest them, and continue to brainwash them by giving them more and more disgusting ways to be perverted, sexually 
and sinful in every way. So teach them to be sinful and nasty, and rip off, murder, and then arrest them. But now let's give them rights and let them vote. Craziness, isn't it? Okay, we're going to move to the next one. Protest as Japan paves way for self-defense law change. A parliamentary committee in Japan has approved two major bills for debate, paving the way for an expanded role for the military. Peace, not war, it says. If the bills are passed, Japan would be able to fight overseas in a doctrine called collective self-defense. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says it is necessary for the country's protection, but polls show many Japanese oppose it. On Wednesday, a special committee set up Japan's lower house to decide on the two security bills gave its approval. The bills will now be presented before Japan's full lower house on Thursday for another round of debate and approval. They still have to clear the upper house as well before they can be passed. Many expect the bills to be passed as both the lower and upper houses of Japan's parliament, known as the Diet, are not dominated by Mr. Abe's Liberal Democratic Party. Just one Liberal Democratic Party after another in this world, isn't it? Greece, America, Japan, Germany, and many others. Japan's post-World War II constitution bars it from using force to resolve conflicts except in cases of self-defense. The cabinet has pushed for a change that would revise the law such that Japan's military would be able to mobilize overseas when they, these three conditions are met, when Japan is attacked or when a close ally is attacked and the result threatens Japan's survival and poses a clear danger to people, when there is no other appropriate means available to repel the attack and ensure Japan's survival and protect its people. Use of force is restricted to a necessary minimum. Yeah, right. That's why we're all preparing to go to war. Every nation in the world being pushed by the Jesuits, by the Vatican, as they control the world. The revived Roman Empire rising. Netanyahu's bid to lobby Congress to kill Iran deal will fail, Obama says. Well, of course. The president spoke to New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman as part of his public relations campaign to rally support for the Iran agreement. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu anticipated efforts to lobby Congress to derail the Iranian nuclear agreement will fail, U.S. President Barack Obama told New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman on Tuesday. The President spoke to Friedman as part of his public relations campaign to rally support for the Iran agreement, which has been subject to scathing criticism from the Israeli government and its sympathizers in the United States. See, I'm one of them. I'm one of those sympathizers for Israel. Prime Minister Netanyahu would prefer, and many of the critics would prefer, that Iran doesn't even have any nuclear capacity, Obama told the New York Times. But really, what that involves is eliminating the presence of knowledge inside of Iran. Nuclear technology is not that complicated today, and so the notion that the yardstick for success was now whether they ever had the capacity, possibly, to obtain nuclear weapons. That can't be the yardstick, Obama said. The question is, do we have the kind of inspection regime and safeguards and international consensus whereby it's not worth it for them to do it? We have accomplished that. Obama told Friedman he was confident that Congress will not be able to muster enough nay votes to shoot down the agreement, much to the chagrin of the Israeli Prime Minister. And next up from Bloomberg Business, weapons inspection in Iran shadowed by past mistakes in Iraq. In this 2002 file photo, UN inspectors searched for weapons inside a military industrial complex in Baghdad, Iraq. The landmark agreement with Iran promises weapons inspectors broad access to the country's nuclear program, but the Islamic Republic's track record and the history of similar efforts in Iraq cast a shadow over the deal. 
The lessons of experience are clear, as in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, inspections in Iran will succeed only if the U.S. and its partners show they are willing to punish violations, according to analysts and former inspectors. No one wants to relive the repeated battles over access to Iraq's suspected nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons sites. This is yesterday's or news, the 14th. Making the deal with Iran stick will be especially challenging. The threat to reimpose economic sanctions that would be lifted under the agreement may become less credible over time as Western banks, businesses, and investors return to the Iranian market. Should other measures fail, airstrikes like those used in Iraq would be difficult against Iran's hardened or buried military targets. The whole Iraq experience and all of the negative consequences make one quite sober about the prospect of trying to make sure we get it right with Iran, says Greg Thielman, a former State Department specialist on nuclear proliferation. And we have four more pieces of news here. Black Swan Taleb warns calm before the storm. Western countries are increasingly displaying symptoms of instability as described by Nassim Taleb, the author of The Black Swan, ever since the publication of an essay written with Gregory. In the New World Order of Corporate America Recruiting, <laughs> Greeks can't tap cash, gold, silver in bank safety deposit boxes. Eurozone Goldman Sachs, Greece, Hong Kong, Greeks can okay. Greeks capital controls also prevent access to contents of safe deposit boxes. Wow, they won't even let them in their safe deposit boxes now. They're going to steal all their money. Restrictions on safe deposit access doesn't protect banking system unless contents confiscated. Readers should heed warnings by Mark Faber and Eon Spreadbury of Fidelity. Important to own assets outside banking system and not in bank safe deposit boxes, own physical bullion in private safety deposit boxes and the safest private vaults. Hmm. Yep. It'd be a good idea if you get your money out of the bank. Moving on to the last three here. Venezuela bars opposition leader from holding office. Opposition leader Maria Karina Makad, one of Venezuela's most prominent opposition leaders, announced Tuesday that she had been barred from holding public office as a critical election looms. Former lawmaker Maria Karina Makado posted a notice on Twitter saying the Comptroller's Comptroller's office prohibited her from holding office for a year, which could prevent her from taking her seat if she wins one in December's congressional elections. She did not say why she was barred, but she apparently has the option to appeal the decision. The Comptroller's office could not be reached for comment. Mikado is among hardline leaders who called for President Nicolas Maduro to resign last year and helped lead sometimes bloody street protests demanding on end to the South American country's socialist administration. The ruling party stripped her of her congressional seat amid the protests. In the past year, Mikado has become one of the most visible faces of the opposition, continuing to lead protests against Maduro. The state prosecutor's office has accused her of conspiring to assassinate Maduro, a charge she denies as ridiculous. On Tuesday, she called the comptroller's order another affirmation that the ruling party con constitutes a dictatorship, adding that she and her supporters would prove themselves to be the majority in the upcoming elections. Polls show the opposition leading strongly as Venezuelans tire of chronic shortages, crime, and inflation. The order did not appear to specify the reason Mercado will be barred from public office. Politicians are most commonly banned from office when they are accused of raiding public coffers, but Mercado has been out of office for a year without any obvious access to state funds. She is the second high 
high-profile opposition leader barred this month from holding public office. Former San Cristobal Mayor Daniel Sabalos won a primary contest to run in December's general election, but was officially barred from holding office last week. He is expected to stand as a candidate anyway. On Tuesday, the opposition coalition rejected the government's move to prevent outspoken critics from running for office and said the orders were a sign of desperation. And <clears throat> from Yahoo, the latest Greece needs 85 billion euros through 2018. The International Monetary Fund says Greece will need debt relief and 85 billion euros or $94 billion in new financing through 2018 because its situation has deteriorated since it closed its banks June 29th. Greece and its creditors reached a bailout agreement Monday that requires Greece to enact painful budget cuts and economic reforms but allows it to keep using the euro currency. But the IMF said Tuesday that Greece's debt can now only be made sustainable through debt relief measures that go far beyond what Europe has been willing to consider so far. Earlier this month, the IMF said Greece needed about 60 billion euros through 2018. But it says Greece's debts will peak over the next two years at 200% of economic output, much higher than earlier estimates. The options, the IMF said, included dramatically extending the terms of the loans, offering deeply discounted de interest rates, and writing down the debt, something Greece's European creditors have resisted. And last but not least, the last report of the day, Israeli court sentences Palestinian rocket engineer to 21 years in jail. An Israeli court sentenced a Palestinian engineer on Tuesday to 21 years in prison for helping Gaza's Hamas militant group develop and improve their weapons capabilities. Darar Abu Sisi, detained by Israeli Israel in 2011, was a director of the Gaza Strip's sole power station. He said he was kidnapped during a visit to Ukraine in February and transferred secretly to Israel. In a plea bargain agreement that sealed a court case lasting over four years, Abu Sisi pleaded guilty to five counts which included membership of a militant organization and building and modifying missiles used against Israel. The accused has been found guilty of offenses carried out over a number of years against state security that include five specific accusations carried out by him. Part of the ruling by a three-judge panel at Beersheba District Court said. Abu Sisi originally denied wrongdoing and Hamas had said he was not a member of their organization but in the amended indictment which led to the plea bargain and the conviction he admitted the charges. There is no dispute over the severity of the accused actions. He was one of the top people involved in improving the destructive ability of Hamas's munitions and rockets, and he was dominant in facilitating Hamas's ability to strike Israeli soldiers and civilians more effectively, the ruling added. Islamist militants in the Gaza Strip, a coastal enclave controlled by Hamas, have over five over years fired thousands of rockets and mortar bombs at Israel, but the firing has largely subsided since a 50-day war last year in which more than 2100 Gazans and 73 Israelis mostly soldiers were killed okay folks well that's gonna be all for tonight sorry that I had to rush it but there was an awful lot of news God bless you